to our opening session of our eighth annual symposium on healthcare. My name is Michael Ketterhagen, and I'll be with you this morning for the first hour and a half or so, hour and 15, 20 minutes, and with John Sprater, who's an acupuncturist uh, at the Fond du Lac Center for Spirituality and Healing, and um, also a member of the team down there. Let me tell you a little bit, I'll be speaking as a theologian. I teach theology here at Marion University, for those of you who don't know that. And I'll be speaking as a theologian, even though it sounds like much of the stuff that I'll be talking about is scientific. My theology is a practical theology, and my theology is a theology of comparison, comparative theology, where I compare different religious traditions to help me understand Christianity, help me understand Catholicism a little bit better. So even though it sounds like everything that I'll be talking about and that we'll be talking about is comes from a scientific and very modernistic perspective, um, there's theology in back of it and you'll understand that as time goes on. Um, to start off, I'd like to uh, start us off with prayer. And in the, the mode of the Christian tradition, there is a process called chanting or Gregorian chant. And that process is also uh, a very significant process because it brings us into a state of calm and peace. It brings us into a state of our breathing starts to relax, our, our metabolism starts to change, our breath rate starts to, to move in a different pattern. And uh, so I'd like to have us uh, chant along this, uh, this chant with me. I'll, I'll, let you, I'll introduce it to you and then we'll, then we'll do it. Um, it means, come Holy Spirit. So actually we're inviting God into our midst. And it goes like this. Veni Sancte Spiritus, 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 Veni Sancte Spiritus. Veni Sancte Spiritus, 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 Veni Sancte Spiritus. Thank you. Okay, we're here to talk about complementary and alternative medicine, alternative therapies. Originally the term was therapies that we used for our announcement, but it's really medicine that we're talking about. And so let me define the term first. Complementary medicine and alternative medicine is a group of diverse medical and healthcare systems and practices and products that are not presently considered part of the conventional system, part of conventional medicine. Now, complementary means it fits in to the other, to the conventional medicines. Alternative means that it, it would be in place of. Now, there's another important definition that needs to be looked at, and that's the definition of integrative medicine. This is the least offensive See, if we talk about alternative uh, medicine uh, to the medical world, we're talking about eliminating their jobs. And that's offensive. So an integrative definition would, would be helpful. These are medical practices or health care systems and practices that combine the conventional and the medical. In other words, we have a, a, a mutual sort of relationship there. Not that um, one complements another that is really in charge. So that's a very important, significant sort of uh, way of looking at things. However, that's a term that's not necessarily being used a lot within our culture because uh, the, the world of CAM, as it's called, complementary alternative medicine, is a term that's used. 
Now, there are different types of CAM modalities. There are different types of, uh, and these are the five major ones, as you can see, and I'm going to go through quickly. I'm going to quickly go through them, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of an underlying uh, theory as to why complementary and alternative medicines are, are significant and important, and why they're different from our regular understanding of conventional medicine. So there's the, the alternative medical systems, then the body-mind systems, the biologically-based therapies, the manipulative and body-based methods, and then also energy therapies. Energy therapies are the most exciting right now uh, because they're on sort of the cutting edge of what's coming in medicine. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. So let's look at it. There's government interest here first, before I do that. There's government interest in this whole thing. Back in 1999, the uh, National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine was established under the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. And first it was funded $50 million, just a slight little, you know, when, when we talk about government money, $50 million is like three pennies. It's little stuff. So it's just started out. Now they're at the point where uh, the last, this present fiscal year, uh, every year we have 128 Point eight million. Now that's still not very much considering the fact that we spend so much on bombs and other things like that. But it is more. And the budget increase, hopefully, for 12 and 13, is going to be 2.2 million more, up to 131 million. Now, some research that has been done in those areas uh, are they're, they're looking at determining the effects of. Uh, acupuncture, exploring mind-body medicine, investigating dietary and supplementary uh, impacts. Uh, it affects the effects of meditation, mindfulness, massage therapy, inflammation, how inflammation is reduced because of th massage therapy, other things like that. So it has a lot of very, very specific research that's being done in the area. Okay, now let's look at each one of those um, CAMs. This is the whole systems. If you look at the, see the bottom of the screen, it says the two that we're most used to right now in our culture, which would be called conventional medicine, are allopathy and osteopathy. Now, what's allopathy? Allopathy is the treating of the pathos, the pathos, with something that is different. If I have a sore throat, what I do, I give it an antibiotic. If I have a uh, system that's draining, my sinuses are draining all over the place, I give myself an antihistamine to make sure that things start to dry up. And that's generally what conventional medicine is. You, you look at uh, something and you try to alleviate it by doing something opposite. And then osteopathy is the, the manipulation of, of the uh, spinal column in particular to relieve the pathos, the suffering. Uh, Any anytime you see P-A-T-H-Y, it's we're talking about suffering there. We're talking about the, the pathos, the, the pain or the agony that goes on. So then there are these others that are really whole systems. Uh, traditional Chinese medicine and, and John Sprayer will be talking a lot uh, about that. I'm going to be giving you a little bit of an overview and then John Sprayer who is our acupuncturist here will be uh, uh, sharing about acupuncture and its impact. Uh, and then Ayurveda is the whole system of India. And it, those two are really old, six, 7,000 years old. They're a lot older than our conventional medicine. Our conventional medicine started about 150, 200, 225 years ago uh, as far as its process is concerned within the United States. And then we have naturopathy, that's treating the pathos with natural things, herbs, vitamins, minerals, biological aspects. And then homeopathy, that's treating the pathos or the disease with the same, homeo. Like you give a little mini, although this is a, a poor analogy, you give a little mini vaccination. And what happens is the information that comes into the system then triggers the system to take care of the pathos itself rather than you give them something that is going to fight the germ or fight. This is maybe giving a little bit of something that will help the germ develop a little bit and then stop. Then, okay, let's look at, oops, 
biologically based practices. I'll quickly go through these. The, that's having botanicals or animal derived extracts, vitamins, minerals, fatty acids, amino acids, uh, pri uh, prebiotics and probiotics. Probiotics are, you're familiar with what a probiotic is, even though you may not know what the term means. It's acidophilus. It's this little bug, this little germ, this little bacteria, actually bacteria, that we put into our system and it helps aids in the digestive process. And whole diets, those are biologically oriented biologically based practices. There's also a, an osteopathic biological based practice that is uh, where you inject certain uh, minerals into the joint and what it does is it activates the joint in a way and helps the body reproduce new tissue so that you don't need a knee replacement, you just are growing new tissue. And that stuff is happening. In, in our culture today, and it's a permanent fix. It's not after 12 years you have to get a new knee. So it's a very interesting process out there. Then, then we have the manipulative and the body-based. And those are, um, you're familiar with these, chiropractic adjustment, craniosacral, that's a massage, Feldenkrais, there's massage therapy, um, osteopathic manipulations, reflexology, that's where you, touch different parts of the hand or touch different parts of the foot, of the feet, and you connect with different organs within the system, helping the communication flow in those ways. Then we go on to, I'm, I'm quickly doing this because I just want to quickly go through these so that you're aware of the vastness, just the, the incredible vastness that is not just um, flaky stuff, not just out on the fringe, although it is in the fringe here in the United States, the United States doesn't understand lots of this stuff because we have a mindset that, that's different than, than other mindsets, different than the Chinese, different than the Indians, different than other, different than Europe even. And, uh, but they're also funded by the United States government. And so there's a lot of support for all this. So I'll quickly go through this, and then I want to, the most important thing for me is for you to understand why this works and what, what the difference is in this whole thing. So then we have the mind-body mind medicine, and that's, that's your, you're really uh, familiar with that in, in many ways. This is where it focuses on the interactions of the brain and the mind and the body and the behavior and the powerful ways in which emotional and mental and social and spiritual and behavioral factors affect our body, affect our health. The mind-body medicine regards as fundamental the approach that respects and enhances each person's capacity to self-knowledge and self-care. When a person begins to understand, according to this perspective, that their mind has a lot to do with how healthy they are. And the attitudes that they have have a lot to do with the um, cancer that's developing, or a lot to do with all the other illnesses that may be flowing through us. When we begin to get a handle on that, that that's what this is talking about. It's trying to help us know and understand that, so that then out of that knowledge then, we can then um, really make some differences and move towards health. Here are some of the practices, the mind-body practices. They are, of course, relaxation, meditation, hypnosis, Visual imagery, yoga, biofeedback, tai chi, qigong, those are the Chinese worlds, uh, the cognitive behavior therapies, uh, rational emotive therapy, uh, neuro-linguistic therapies, some of the others that are part of that, autogenic training, that's where you give yourself, you say, I can walk, I can walk, I can walk, I can walk, and you start to walk, even if you not the, and then spirituality and prayer. The spirituality is the movement a person takes to move towards God, their understanding of God. Then we go on to energy medicine. <clears throat> now, I'm going to give you two very technical terms here. These are, this is specifically for the nurses here. I love nurses. I love nurses. <sighs> I shouldn't have said this. <laughs> because I'm married to a nurse. And, <sighs> and I love her. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, they're veritable en energies. Those are the ones that we can measure. Those are the ones that conventional medicine says exists because we can measure them. Then there are the putative 
And these are the ones that are so subtle that they're not measurable by the conventional wisdom that we have right now. Although, uh, computers are starting to be able to pick up these sensitivities. And of course, these are the same sort of uh, energies that dogs know. They know when you're angry. They know when they're upset. They can feel it. And so we're just, we're just not aware of a lot of that. And also, too, in conventional medicine, the only value, value, valued tool is a tool that is not a human tool. Double blind. What do you do? You eliminate the human being completely from the scientific experiment. You don't want any influence at all from the doctor. You don't want any influence at all from the patient. Double blind. So, the mo but the most valuable tool that we have is this tool right here, our tool our tool. And everything that we make as a tool really is an extension of our sight, extension of our hearing, extension of our touching, extension of our, of our, of us. And so this is, the human being is the tool that is most valuable and the most despised. Because it doesn't, it's not, people are worried that it's not going to be trusted. Right? So we have these two types of, 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 of energies. Variable energies, uh, you're familiar with this, with these. That's the PET, the CTs, the MRIs. That's in the conventional medicine world. And then there are other sort of alternative, uh, complementary, complementary and alternative uh, uh, methods of, of uh, veritable energies like magnetic therapy or sound therapy or light therapy. There's even a commercial out now. It's on uh, Direct TV where this guy's pressing, they have more wired up. And, and, and he's pressing uh, weights, and you can see his muscles getting bigger and bigger. And this other guy's just sitting watching direct TV, and the muscles are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Why? They're putting sound there, sound waves into the muscles to stimulate the muscles. And, and of course, then that's what it is that is going to make him strong. He doesn't have to press weight, press uh, 10,000 pounds or whatever. 100 pounds, you know, constantly. He just needs to sit and have it stimulate. So, um, sound wave, light therapy, things like that. Then there are the punitive methods, energy practices. Acupuncture, Qigong, traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, homeopathy. These all work on the energy level. Reiki, healing touch, polarity therapy, Distance healing, there's evidence, scientific evidence, that distance healing actually is, actually is a reality. I know a number of, of healing touch therapists who use it regularly, and they, they just haven't done the double blind work and the scientific work that allows for the, it to be reported in a journal, but the work, the, the healing occurs. Um, all kinds of of different energies. And some of those energy systems look like this. This is an example of the Chinese energy system. I'm not going to spend much time here with this, but I just want you to see that so that you can see that all those points and energy points and those connections there are, are connections that are, that are important part of, um, well, actually this is not the, the, the acupuncture system. This is the um, Ayurvedic system. Every single one of those points, flow of energy. Okay, now, what's behind all this? What's behind this integrated medicine? The key is that human beings are not just bodies. The physical is not the dimension, the only dimension of reality or illness. The real causes of death are really non-physical. And, and there's a Fond du Lac community did a, a study back in 1995, 96, and discovered the 10 leading causes of death in the area, accidents, suicide, you know, on the outside border there of the diagram. And then you can see, too, that there are nine actual causes. An example would be um, one of firearms. Our, our, one of our police officers was killed just recently. And the actual cause of his death was the fire being shot. However, the root cause is not physical. The root cause is probably an anger, frustration, powerlessness, low self-esteem, maybe helplessness, maybe it was economic despair. We don't know why the person pulled the trigger 
and held off the police officers. That evidence hasn't come out yet. But it, it really is not just the physical that even controls our death, according to that study. Getting back to this, the human being then is a, a unity of three realities. Consciousness, soul, consciousness, which is another way of saying soul or spirit, and then the mind and body. Let's look at that. This is one way of looking at a diagram of it. We have this body with the mind and spirit. That's the way we would look at it in the Western world. We have a body, and the body has a mind and a spirit. But there's another way of looking at it. In the Eastern world, it would be, we are spirits, or we are consciousness, that has a body, that has a mind, and that there's this connection point between the two, the breath. So, those are two ways of really looking at who we are. And I'd like to have us understand that, that those two different per perspectives are very key and very significant. I'd like to compare them in reference to, to what we have here. You can see in the diagram there, consciousness is at the top in both of them. In the, and the matter or the physical world is at the bottom in both of them. And you can see that material in between is pretty accurate. Uh, we have molecules and cells and, and uh, neuronal shifts or energies. And then, then we have over on the uh, eastern side, we have the same molecule cells and, and the causes of the energy flow. The interesting thing is, the eastern perspective is, says that the cause of illness is consciousness or spirit or what a person's attitude towards life is. Let me give you an example of consciousness. Consciousness would be the meaning that a person has in life, or the, or the uh, joy that a person is experiencing in life, or the lack of joy. If a person's not feeling that joy, that lack of joy then creates disturbances in the energy pattern. And then the cells get changed, and the molecules get affected, and then you have cancer. The Western world says that's a bunch of baloney. The root cause of cancer now, all the research indicates, I was talking to some just new docs coming out of uh, Medical College of Wisconsin, a couple of graduates from here, four years ago, and they say, no, the, the cause of cancer right now we understand is a genetic issue. All we have to do is find that right gene and then, then the molecules will be adjusted properly, and the cells will be, and then the person will be, have a good energy flow, and then the pattern will be fine. Then you won't have cancer. So you can see they're coming from two totally different directions. And what would be the remedy then, or what would be the medicine that you would use? If you were looking at it from the Eastern perspective, you would look at quality of life. You would look at how happy the person is, what meaning does the person have in life, what, has, what tragedy has happened in a person's life. There's some evidence indicating that within 18 months to two years after a huge divorce happens in a family, a real fighting divorce happens between two couples, or someone has lost someone whom they really deeply love, that within 18 to 24 months, cancer cells show up. They don't know why, but it makes sense. There's this heart problem that's here, heart. And the heart then, then from the Eastern perspective, has been hurt, creating problems, lack, lack of life, lack of, and then gradually then the immune system doesn't allow it to take over and do what it needs to do to, to make uh, the, and to attack those, those uh, cancer cells, and the person, the woman, develops cancer. In the West, that's not, that's considered totally, completely uh, foolishness. Because the West has the perspective that it started because you have a genetic issue, or you have, you look at the history, mom had it, grandma had it, and you have that genetic tendency and flow. And that's a very, very important difference between the two. And, and we need to know that and understand that so that we can talk to each other and begin to know where people are coming from and not say one is right and one is wrong, 
but they are possibly both right. In the, let me give you a little bit of history here. Conventional medicine's view of the human being generally as a sensory motor apparatus, where you have the senses in the body. What do you do? You take care. What do you, what do, you do when you have a, a knee that's having problems? You don't talk about self-esteem or pride or things like that, because that's usually what the image of knee is all about. This is this, you bend the knee. And it's a whole idea of pride. And you talk about, oh, there must, the person has to have a, uh, uh, a knee replacement, or the person, uh, my dad you know, had a knee replacement, so I'm going to have to have a knee replacement. My son's going to have to have a knee replacement. And so we don't talk about things in those terms. But the West does. And in the 19th and 20th century, you had this view of the human being as a body and a mind operating somewhat separately. People understood that there was a mind out there, but they really didn't know the connection. Gradually, towards the end of the 20th century, they started to make that connection. What do doctors usually do when they don't know how to, when they can't find a germ, when they can't find a, 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 a something that's wrong with the blood or something like that? What do they usually do? Oh, you better go see a There must be something in your head. So, the, the, the mind people are out there, the mind doctors are out there, and the, and the physical doctors are out there, and they're just starting to talk to each other. Not too much, but they're starting to talk to each other. And, they're start, and doctors are starting to realize that stress, that's a mental thing, causes a lot of pain, causes a lot of headache. And so, the 20, and that happens in the late, this happened more and more in this past late 20th century, just before. But, in fact, we are this whole being with a body, mind, and a spirit. And this is a way of looking at it, that image of the three bullseye, in a lineal fashion. You have this, these senses and body that are connected by the breath, moving into the mind, and there are two aspects of the mind, the conscious and the unconscious. And then you have this, the spirit or the self, that part that's very different from the mind, very different from the body, and yet is us as well. Another way of looking at it would be, according to holistic approach, the Eastern approach, we are not our bodies, we are not our minds, we are not even our breath and our spirit. I mean, we are not even our breath and our, and our physical energy. We are something else. But we have those qualities. We have those aspects. If I were to come in here and weighing 360 pounds, I weigh about 180, I wouldn't say double Michael is here now. Dr. Dr. Kellerhagen has decided to you know, give this, or let's say I weigh 90 pounds. I wouldn't say half Michael is here now. No, I'm here, whether I'm 90, 180, or 360. So we even know that we're not our bodies. We spend a lot of time on them. We spend a lot of time worrying about them. We want to know what shape it's in. We want to know if, what color it is. We even start to decorate it. You know all kinds of tattoos and all kinds of metal. But still, we are not our bodies. Just like we're not our energy. Our energy, we have energy. Um, and the energy that we're talking about here is this energy dimension. That's that subtle part of us that is able to allow us to, to move and run in the way we want to move and run. Like my daughter-in-law. She's a mother of five boys. And she's a long distance runner. She's run three marathons. Sometimes she says to her, her husband, Josh, oh, I don't have any energy. I can't get out of bed this morning. And I say to myself, she can run 26.2 miles. And she can't lift one foot up here and that foot up here and stand up. That's what we're talking about. That ability to do that is energy. That's actual physical stuff. It's closely connected with our emotions. You know, that person who's depressed is a Move. Best thing to do with a person who's depressed, get them out and walking. Move them around. And, and we also, so we're not our energy, but it's a very important part of us. We're also not our minds. My mom taught me that. My dad had uh, manic depression issues. It's called bipolar today. And sometimes mom would uh, let us know in the morning how dad was. Mom would say, dad's got his mind today, so you don't have to worry about it. Or dad lost his mind today. And sometimes when I would say some things to mom, that like mom a little upset, a little worried, she would say, careful, Michael, you don't want to lose your mind. And I was 10, 11, 12 years old. I was a philosopher back then. 
I said to myself, hmm, now what? It's going to lose its mind. Because mom said dad lost his yesterday, but he has it today. If I lost my mind, can I find my mind? So I realized that we're not our mind. We are spirits. We're consciousness. We are beings that have a mind and have a body that breathes. And that's the core of holistic health. That's the core of uh, Eastern understanding of medicine. Because the Eastern understanding of medicine, or the human being, is that we're made in the image and likeness of God. And God is spirit. Now you understand what I'm talking about coming from the theological perspective. Everything is theology in my head. But the Western perspective is that we are rational animals. No talk of spirit. This is the Aristotelian. This is the classical Western understanding. We are spiritual beings with minds and bodies. That's the image that, that is very important and very helpful for us. Now, for me. So it's this unity of mind, body, and breath is health. When consciousness and mind and body are connected and treated as a whole unit, then we are, even the holistic, even the World Health Association says this, we are in health. The harmony of those three. So medicine, even though we talk about complementary and alternative medicine, I prefer the integrative medicine image. We're talking about trying to pull together the spirit, the mind, and the body, the breath of us as human beings, so that we can be on the same page. An example of that would be um, uh, uh, I'll mention her name because I because she said I could tell her story. Sister Helen, uh, she was uh, when the Found Lake Center for Spirituality and Healing started in 2000. She said, I want to be part of that. I want to be part of that. I want to. And so I said, well, okay, well, let her be a receptionist. I was worried because she was falling all over the place. She was, had fallen a couple of times and she really wasn't very healthy. And I didn't want someone who was going to be there uh, at the center being, uh, you know, falling over at the center and then be in the center of spirituality and healing. Well, what happened was uh, she was, had a condition where the doctors didn't know what was wrong with her. Uh, she was in a lot of pain, so they gave her a lot of pain medication, and they didn't know what it, what it was, and they're, they're really struggling. So she came to the center. What happened there? She started yoga. She started Fel Feldenkrais. She did healing touch. She met John Sprayer, the, our acupuncturist, and started being involved in traditional Chinese medicine. She hugged everyone who came in. Would you like a hug? She hugged everyone who came in. She hugged everyone before they left. A real in a significant interchange of energy between the people when they hug each other. Life force going to life force, life force going to life force. And she also had a sense of purpose and meaning. Before that, she was seen that she was heading towards death. She was 82 then. She just turned 90 last week. And she's now, she said, she's healthy. And she's really spry. She retired from the center because she has other things to do, she says. So holistic health is, is, the, is the method that really needs to be explored. It needs to be examined. And this is the method that, that we're talking about. Because healing means making whole. It comes from that Anglo-Saxon word. And then to give you some lists of complementary and alternative medicines, integrative medicines, integrative modalities that are available here in Fond du Lac. Fond du Lac is not the end of the world. Fond du Lac is not the cave, not the dungeon. There are lots of wonderful things happening when it comes to complementary and alternative medicines here in the city. Most people just aren't aware of it. There's yoga, tai chi, meditation, Feldenkrais, healing touch, Reiki, Healing touch and Reiki are the energy modalities, reflexology and massage modalities, Yigong, the Chinese, acupuncture, John will be up here shortly and tell you, 
finish about that. Healing touch, another energy modality, developed by a nurse, actually, from the Western medical model. Massage therapy, emotional freedom and healing. What's that? That's where you find different spots on the body and you tap the different parts of the body and that sense that activates the energy of the body, the energy then moves into all kinds of good healthy patterns. Homeopathy, another very subtle process. I'll tell you a story about homeopathy on myself. I, um, I, was, I thought I had the flu, really bad, high fever, high temperature and stuff for, like, for three days. And, uh, but just before I, I got the, that high temperature, I went to the doctor to get uh, some blood test, blood work done because I, wanted, I was going to be seeing my, my internist uh, next week and I wanted to have that blood work done so that he could talk with me about it. And uh, luckily, but I was worried uh, when I went and I found myself thinking that maybe I had uh, uh, real problems with my prostate because uh, I was having trouble urinating. And so, and that was, that was a problem for a while, uh, for that day. But, but on that Thursday, I got the tests. Friday, I was in bed. Saturday, I was in bed. Sunday, I was in bed. It was terrible. I felt like I was going to die. Um, so, and, and Monday was my appointment with the doctor. Well, what happened was I, I, um, I believe in really all the other things that you can do to, to make myself uh, healthy. And I uh, pumped myself with vitamin C. I even began to explore um, homeopathy, and not explore it, but I found a remedy. Sure enough, within an hour, I started to feel better. Two hours later, I started to feel really, really good. Three hours later, I felt like I was getting back to myself. I took a couple more uh, remedies of homeopathy, and the next day went to, this was Sunday, next day went to the doctor, and he said to me, well, tell me, what happened to you lately? He knew what happened to me. He had my blood work right there. I had prostatitis. Huge. The, the, my PSA was over 18, 18 point something. You know, cancer of prostatitis is about, or uh, PSA is about five or six. So he said, oh, no, no, you don't have cancer. You, you had a huge prostate infection, but it's not there now. What had happened? So he began to show me, you know, that I had done with homeopathy what he would have given me an antibiotic for and, and it, it really worked. So all these things are available in the city. All these things, art therapy, quantum therapy, and I want to not talk anymore because I want to have more time for John to be able to give his uh, understanding of what acupuncture is. We will have time, we'll have about 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so for questions and answers at the end of, of John's presentation. Okay, so give me a few seconds for us to switch things over. Hear me without the mic or not? Is it okay, or do you want me to pick up a mic? You need me to use the mic. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. Uh, let me just give you a brief introduction to who I am. Uh, my name is John Sprader. I'm an acupuncturist now, but like a lot of you, I started out in Western medicine. My undergrad was in pre-med, and I used to do research in tumor and transplantation immunology <clears throat> at the Medical College of Wisconsin. I was trained as a lab tech in the Air Force, so I did all kinds of med techy types of things. And while I was in there, I used to do some research um, at that time in lipoprotein, electrophoresis, and some other things. So I have a long background in Western medicine, and uh, <clears throat> I'm a research scientist. And uh, I didn't get into acupuncture <clears throat> because um, of anything other than I began to understand it and saw the power of it at the time. But I had every intention to go into Western medicine and just become a doc and treat people. Um, but I got involved with the uh, alternative or complementary world into uh, acupuncture. Um, <clears throat> Bill, Dr. Dunbar, opened one of the colleges uh, in the United States. The reason this came about, acupuncture came into the United States, we're, we're newcomers here. Um, in the United States, 
You might think we have the best medicine on the planet. The World Health Organization will disagree with that. They will tell you that we're at least 36th and dropping. That means there's at least three dozen other countries on the planet that have lots better health care than we do. Why? Because in our country, we principally use two forms of therapy, drugs, radiation, and surgery. Well, three, drugs, radiation, and surgery. We're doing all allopathy, which Mike was talking to you about. But if you go to Germany, France, Belgium, Egypt, I don't care where you go, Israel, they have lots better health care because they employ these other modalities. And the more tools you have in your tool belt, the better job you can do. Let me uh, see if I can get you a slide here real quick. And, yeah, I don't want to know. <clears throat> Those are a couple of my daughters. And what you call a dodo, dads of daughters only. I've got four daughters. Um, the one on the left there, Michaela, um, developed pneumonia. That comes about from a variety of circumstances. She developed it twice. The first time, um, my wife is also an acupuncturist, an herbalist, and of course we panicked and went off to Western medicine and did the usual treatment. She was sick for a long time with the, um, with the uh, uh, pneumonia that she had. Okay. Um, the second time that she got <coughs> the pneumonia, we said, we're going to do something about that, and we're going to use a medicine that we believe in. And we used it. She was well in four hours. Now, kids respond a lot faster than uh, uh, the adults do. We take a little bit longer. But the point being that even those of us who are working in the alternative, try, you know, we kind of go back to our roots and our upbringing, which is all Western medicine, let's get some antibiotics, let's get some drugs, and to get this under control. So acupuncture and herbs do a great job in healing the body. And um, by way of one more little slide here, <clears throat> I don't know if you can see this, this was in Reader's Digest, 1974. Um, Chinese medicine came into the United States back in the, in the 60s when Nixon opened up China to the United States. Prior to that point, the only Chinese medicine was in Chinatown. Um, when he went over there, the president travels with an entourage, including physicians. They are usually uh, military physicians, so they're a very conservative lot. And while they were over there, one of the reporters for the New York Times had an emergency appendectomy performed under acupuncture anesthesia. So he was wide awake and talking to the surgeons while he's having his appendix removed. And the president's physicians were watching this. And I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall watching that episode. Um, this lady that you see here in 1974, a young lady, she's, uh, I don't know if you can read that, the first, I first witnessed acupuncture at the University of Shanghai about 20 years ago. The patient was a 28-year-old woman about to have open heart surgery. She was placed on the operating table, wide awake and smiling. I don't know about you, I don't think I'd be smiling if I'm having open heart. But she's clearly smiling. <clears throat> then to my astonishment, the surgeon proceeded to open her chest. Okay, we're talking incisions and rib spreaders and all that stuff that goes into that type of surgery. Her only anesthetic was acupuncture needle in her right earlobe that was connected to an electrical source. She never flinched. There was no mask on her face, no intravenous needle in her arm. This is an account, uh, this account is not hearsay. I was there and took the photograph on this page. In, in China, when I was over there <clears throat> the last time, um, I had the privilege of being in the operatory uh, for some of the surgeries under acu using acupuncture as the anesthesia. Um, in one case, a lady was having a goiter removed uh, in her neck. And uh, for her, the advantage of having acupuncture anesthesia was um, several fold. One, she didn't need any blood products, and of course there was no risk with the, that's always associated with general anesthesia. And third, when they got to a delicate part of the surgery, they reach in and they touch areas um, and they short out the nerve that runs the voice box. So they know exactly what not to cut. So she ran zero risk of losing her voice in that procedure. When the surgery was over, she sat up, 
She squeezed my hand, she smiled, she drank water, uh, and they wheeled her way to the recovery room. I happened to be in a group that included, uh, in our group, uh, an ob doc from Chicago, an uh, anesthesiologist from Perth, Australia. People come from all over the world to go into China to learn some of this medicine. Um, it's going to be a while before you find acupuncture anesthesia in the hospitals here. There's a lot of legal things that get in the way, <clears throat> and the anesthesiologist would have to go and take some training to be able to do that. But it is used, and it is real medicine. So you might be asking, how the heck does this work? How does putting a needle in somebody do these types of things? I'll give you this short overview of how that works. <clears throat> when there are energy flows in your body. These have been documented scientifically. Um, radioactive isotope studies um, using squids, superconducting quantum interference devices. Um, these are better microscopes that can measure these energies. They're there where the Chinese said they are. They move in the direction the Chinese said they move. And there are hot spots called acupuncture points. If you look on your skin, you can't tell any difference between this spot and that spot. But if you look under electron microscopy, you'll see some differences in the cells and the structures that are there at the acupuncture points. And these energy flows are moving up and down your body all the time. Um, and when we insert a needle in these acupuncture points, we can do a lot of things. We can regulate the flow of these energies in the body, redirect them, uh, remove blockages, and so forth. And that makes your physiology change. When we insert needles, we'll cause a release of a bunch of chemical mediators, for those of you who like the biochemistry background. We'll cause a lot of uh, chemicals to be released, bradykinin, substance P, a bunch of players from the arachidonic acid cycle, histamine, and so forth, which will preferentially stimulate afferent C fibers, a particular type of nerve cell, that will transmit electrical impulses along your nerves, into your spinal cord, up various spinal thalamic tracts, to the brain, and then a whole bunch of players come alive up there. The hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, uh, the periaqueductal gray, the amygdala, the hippocampus. There are many different structures that are going to play roles now. And then there will be an outflow through the two so sources of control that you're well versed in, the nervous system, to change the physiology, and also through your endocrine system, through the pituitary gland, to change your physiology. That's basically the short course of how acupuncture changes your physiology. It does this um, very effectively. Um, let me see here. I'll go quickly through some of this here. Let's see. I don't Michael was talking about some of the different paradigms and so forth. You have to change your thinking. Most of you are used to linear deductive reasoning, Newtonian physics, two and two is four, and so forth. But when you get into real health care and into life, you have to leave that model behind and you have to get into quantum mechanics, Mendel-Barat's equations, and other things to begin to really appreciate what's going on. And we now are developing tools to, to do just that. And um, uh, so some of these subtle energies that Mike was talking to you about can be measured and are being measured right now. Um, there used to be only two squids in the country at two different universities. Now it's like every university's got their own and they're doing a lot of these measurements and so forth. So um, there's plenty of science behind this. Um, let me continue on here. Um, Chinese medicine takes a view that we're sort of like gardeners. And uh, uh, anyone who's had a garden knows that you need some sunshine, some water, some good soil, pH balance, minerals, and so forth. And you can grow uh, good plants. And that's kind of what Chinese medicine is like. We help regulate the flow in the body of the energy. Uh, we provide herbs. It's the absolute antithesis of analytical chemistry. It drives those people nuts. When we use herbs, we'll use formulas uh, to treat. Each herb may be contributing 200 to 400 biologically active compounds. There may be 10, 12, 14 herbs in a formula. So you can see you've got thousands of things all going on. And they work synergistically to nourish and support normal cellular physiology and help you uh, regain the balance that's necessary uh, in the body. 
It is not uh, linear in the sense that you have a pain, so you take an anison. You have a, you're sneezing, you take your antihistamine. You have an infection, you take, um, uh, you know, an antibiotic. Okay. <clears throat> this is much more complex and diverse. Consequently, you get very good healing and cures um, without a lot of the side effects that are often associated with Western allopathic medicine. There is a role for Western allopathic medicine to play, but it's just not the only uh, kid in town here. Um, let me... Uh, Uh, Chinese use a different lingo. You can see yin yang, qi and blood. Um, qi, we don't really have a word for in English. It loosely translates as energy, but it's much uh, broader than that concept. Um, yin yang, I think everybody's somewhat familiar with. This is the duality of opposites, uh, up and down, right and left, in and out, male and female, night and day, and so forth. Um, this is their language that they use to describe uh, some of their medicine. Um, so you can see some examples of yin yang. Uh, let's see. These are some chi flows. This is how it moves in your body from the different meridians um, through the body. Uh, this is a little illustration of some of those meridians that Mike was uh, alluding to. Um, they've proven this scientifically. If we take isotopes, if you take an ice, uh, anything and put it in a Petri dish, it'll randomly diffuse out. If I inject a drug in a vein, guess what it's going to do? It's going to move with the blood in the direction that blood is moving. If I take a radioactive isotope like technetium-99 and I inject it random, randomly on you, it'll just diffuse. But if I inject it in the meridian, it's going to move in the direction that the chi is flowing in that meridian, and you'll have isolated hot spots that will light up uh, at the acupuncture points. <clears throat> um, this is just showing an illustration. If you short out the chi, things aren't happy. If there's chi blockage, you'll have pain. Uh, that's one of the reasons acupuncture works so well for uh, a lot of the pain syndromes that you see out there, everything from low backs to uh, carpal tunnel, et cetera. The list is endless. Um, so what I'd like to do is just give you some ideas of some of the things that acupuncture treats. This is a partial list from the World Health Organization. Um, there are literally hundreds of things. It's a complete medical system. And uh, we use acupuncture herbs, homeopathy, spagyric formulas, all kinds of things to treat uh, conditions. You can see the, the, uh, the list there uh, that uh, it, it fits on that slide, but it's much larger than that. These, it's been proven scientifically that it's effective, it's safe, and it also complements any other therapies that you're currently doing. So there's no... Uh, contraindications for mixing acupuncture with conventional Western medicine. <clears throat> acupuncture is here only because it works. There's no political organization behind it that sustained it for these thousands and thousands of years. The Chinese were very pragmatic. If it worked, they kept it. If it didn't work, they threw it out. There are billions of people who have been treated by acupuncture. Um, and uh, safely and effectively. Let me give you some examples of things, cases and so forth, to give you some perspective <coughs> about acupuncture um, and oil me oriental medicine. Uh, give you a low back example. I had a person who was in construction, owned his own construction business in Milwaukee, came up to see me when I was at the Holistic Center at the Waupon Hospital. Um, and he had an excavating business in and out of ditches. And he would had back surgery. And finally, they said to him, the orthopedic surgeon said, there's nothing more we can do. You have to learn to live with your pain. He came up to see me. This was in the summer, his busy season. He did not come because he wanted to. He came out of absolute necessity because he's a hands-on person running this business. Um, I treated him. He was quickly out of pain, and I said to him, you're not out of the woods yet. I need to finish <coughs> helping your body heal so it's going to stay. He was busy with the season, so he stopped in August. In October that year, he was back on my schedule. I said to him, you need to stay a little longer this time so it'll stay, which he did. 
He's been fine, and that's probably about eight years ago now. He's still jumping in and out of ditches, and he's not in any pain. Um, this is something where the surgery didn't uh, fix the problem. Okay. Um, give you another example. Um, carpal tunnel. A lot of people like to go for the surgeries. It's very expensive. This is, this is the foolishness of Western medicine and how it's practiced here in the United States. You go in for carpal tunnel surgery, you're out $20,000. Well, somebody's paying that bill, maybe not you, but uh, the business is going to pay that bill. You're going to miss work time and so forth. We can fix that for a fraction of that, 1,000, 1,500, maybe in total number of visits and herbs and so forth, and it'll stay fixed. Um, and if you've had the surgery and it's failed, you can still come in and get it fixed. Um, had a gentleman in one of the businesses uh, over in Ripon, came to me for carpal tunnel, uh, fixed him in about, uh, oh, he was out of pain in about eight weeks, and uh, he's been fine ever since, and he again stayed the course to finish up the treatments that took about another month or a month and a half. Age is not a factor. Um, I had a lady come to me in an assisted living situation. I think she was 82 or 84 at the time. Um, and she could not make any progress with her physical therapist. They had given up hope and they were going to put her in a full-fledged nursing home. She didn't want that. So she came to me out of absolute desperation, not because she believed in Chinese medicine or anything else, but I was her last resort, which is normally the case. Uh, I'm not the first person people seek uh, care with. They go to the Western medicine person first. So she came to me. I began treating her after the fourth visit. I said, go back to the physical therapist now so we can work together. And they made progress even on the first visit. It took about uh, three more months to get her fully back. She's now pushing 100. She's still in assisted living. She's out of pain, has been. And if you ask her what that was worth to her, uh, she'll tell you it's priceless. To live pain-free and maintain a quality of life is very important. You're living in a baby boomer generation, and the baby boomers are not happy taking drugs and trying to manage pain. They want to play golf. They want to retire in Florida. They want to go skiing. They want to have an active lifestyle. And you can't do that all doped up with uh, drugs. So they're seeking alternative health care because they want to have solutions rather than chemical uh, band-aids to the problems that, that we're experiencing. Um, in the United States right now, you might, I'll just talk about cancer briefly here, you might think we're making a lot of progress, right? Nixon declared the war on cancer. We've spent billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars on cancer. Where did that all go? To uh, uh, drugs and surgery. <clears throat> Have we changed the outlook of adult cancers since 1960? The answer is no. That's not my numbers. That's their numbers. The outcome is still the same. If you have uh, breast, colon, lung cancer, and your life expectancy is three months, six months, or, or two years, it's still three months, six months, or two years. It has not changed because we're looking for the solutions in the wrong places. Cancer is a multifactorial thing, and anyone who wants to tell you it's all genes is still looking in the wrong place. We have supplements that alter your genes. We can change the inflammatory processes with certain uh, supplements. There's certain forms and ratios, say, for example, of the essential fatty acids Mike was talking about, that change the sirtuin genes and change the expressions in your body to calm down that inflammation. And when we can calm that inflammation down, we can start uh, moving the body into a healing phase. Um, if you get outside the United States, you'll find people curing cancer all the time. Um, I attended the first conference on cancer and alternative medicine held in Arlington, Virginia back in the late 90s. Um, it's an international conference. There were thousands of people from all over the world there. I sat next to Bernie Siegel in the audience. Um, you might know him because he's the Yale or Harvard MD with the bald head uh, who's written a number of best-selling books, Life, Medicine, and Miracles, among others. He's been on some of the talk shows. Um, and I met a lot, a lot of people. I met a woman who was uh, cured of a very virulent form of breast cancer um, that kills in weeks. And she can use the cure word because she's out uh, I don't know, eight years at that point. What did she do? 
Did she use just chemo and radiation and so forth? She used those tools, but she used other things as well. And those other things are missing here in the United States. And because of that, we're still in the dark ages here. Um, when I was attending a conference in, uh, in uh, Kansas City um, on one of the pieces of equipment that I use, um, <clears throat> it's a very specialized form of electrical stim called FSM. Um, and uh, uh, there are studies that have been done now. Uh, it's more effective than the best drugs on COX and LOX inhibitors out there. Those are inflammatory little players. Um, there are uh, plastic surgeons in Hollywood that are using it for all the supermodels and stuff, and uh, stuff because it rapidly speeds up the healing process. Um, and uh, I happened to meet a physician at this conference. And I, you know, I said, well, you know, there's not, usually not a lot of MDs at some of these conferences in alternative medicine, so we went to lunch. Turns out he used to be the uh, head of the emergency department at Kansas City, uh, in, in Kansas City um, uh, Medical Complex. It's a huge complex. It makes Milwaukee's uh, medical complex look small. He headed the emergency department there. He's board certified in emergency medicine. And a number of years ago, uh, he contracted pancreatic cancer. And if you know anything about that, nobody seems to survive that in the United States. And so he went through all the Western medicine that was available. And when his oncologist told him, you know, get your affairs in order, you got a few weeks left, he didn't like that idea. So he got in a silver bird and flew off to see Richard Helms. Who's Richard Helms? He's a medical doc who practices oriental medicine and heads the World Federation on Acupuncture and Moxibustion. Went to see Richard. Richard cured him of cancer. We can use a cure word because at that point he was out, I don't know, eight or nine years. <clears throat> and he came back to Kansas City. And he has a practice right now. And at that time, <clears throat> he uh, had over 300 cancer patients. He was no longer practicing emergency medicine. He'd left that. He still retains his hospital privileges. And even when he goes into the hospital and he sees his friends, his buddies that he used to play golf with and go to the country club with, they, they, they see him alive. They know he's supposed to be dead. They don't even ask him what he did. Why is he still alive? They don't even, the question doesn't even come into their mind. He has over 300 cancer patients and he hasn't lost one. I would challenge any oncologist in the immediate vicinity to equal those odds. In the Midwest, we're way, way behind. If you get out on either coast and other parts of the country, you're going to see successes starting to emerge because these other doctors are using these other therapies to help their patients and they're effective, they're safe, and they don't conflict with other things. So for example, um, in the rest of the world, they would look at, if you're gonna give somebody chemo and you don't use herbs to protect that person, they consider that barbaric. That's like doing su surgery without anesthesia in their minds. If you use the herbs in the acupuncture, you can keep the counts up so they can better tolerate the chemo that they're being given. And they'll get better results. This is the complementary aspect uh, of the medicine. I am passionate about this. Um, and like a lot of you, I've lost uh, family members to that particular critter. So <clears throat> um, I'm in the fight for that. Um, and uh, I am passionate about that. Um, I guess we need to leave some time for questions, yeah. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions, and if you don't get answered, I'll, be, I'll hang out out there um, uh, to try to answer your questions. Um, so, do you wanna? So, so let's, let's then, are, are there any questions about anything that we've talked about yet, so far, yes? I'm going to tell you that it, yes and no, for you, if you're not an MD, no. Uh, it has been done, and I believe it was at uh, in Madison at the University Hospital, because an MD, she had to have surgery, and she wanted acupuncture anesthesia. So they looked the other way, <laughs> and somebody did the anesthesia for her. Um, but they won't do that for the general public yet. Okay? Sister? Have you had any experience of helping 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, don't get me. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, there's a couple things. Uh, Alzheimer's, you got the placking. Um, um, yes, there's, there's wonderful things. Um, I do um, a couple other things. I, I, I use uh, some of Dr. Krasian's work, which has to do with the brain, and also some of some, there's a group of physicians over in Europe, they have something called the Brain Protocol. Um, and yes, there are wonderful ways of treating that that literally not only stop uh, the placking and the deterioration that's going on in the brain, but also reverse it. And that's done with substances, supplements and things. Um, and um, uh, and yeah, that's happening. Uh, even, uh, just to give you an idea, um, uh, they've done, uh, j just drinking distilled water will reverse that. They've done that in an animal model. They have animals that develop Alzheimer's and they've done this with autopsy, so it's, it's as rock solid as you can get. They switched the animals to distilled water. It stopped and reversed the placking, demonstrable by autopsy. Okay, um, just one thing, okay? But there's many more th factors that can be brought to bear that will improve the cognitive function. There's remedies that I use out of Germany. There's remedies developed by, by Dr. K, um, and, uh, and, and they're, they're incredible, literally. Yes. Virtually every insurance company writes policies that cover this. Uh, in 1992 or three, Eisenberg over at Harvard published an article that kind of opened up the door here. Their consumer at that time was spending uh, 13.2 billion dollars out of pocket in alternative therapies when they were only spending 10 billion out of pocket to see Western medicine. So the insurance company said, "Hmm, 13.2 billion, and we don't get a cut of that." There is, it's all based on money, and, so and they wrote policies that cover it, and they all some, do now. There are some, uh, Aetna Life Insurance also is doing something, um, working closely with yoga therapists, and uh, specifically setting up protocols that, that then a, a person goes through a yoga therapy session, and then they no longer need uh, back surgery, and the healing process happens, because just like you put a Band-Aid on, on, it's not the Band-Aid that heals, it's not the surgery that heals, it's not the thing that you do from the outside, but the healing comes from the inside out. That's the whole theory, the whole philosophical understanding of, of what uh, John's talking about and what I'm, I'm mentioning. And so there is some work um, in, in the yoga world too to try to work with insurance companies. Insurance companies are very um, <clears throat> precise because they're interested in the bottom line, they're interested in the money. If you limit your care to what insurance covers, you'll be sadly um, disappointed. I wanted to mention something, James Oshman here, because uh, Michael brought this up when he was talking about, uh, at NIH I've been there, National Institutes of Health. Um, James Oshman heads the alternative branch that he was talking about, the $128 uh, million dollars. He's a very interesting man. I met him at another conference uh, that I was at. Um, uh, he's written a book called um, uh, Energy Medicine, The Scientific Basis. I highly recommend that book to you because there's things in there that are not in your textbooks and probably won't be for another 10 years. And everything in that book is scientific. That means it's been done and reproduced in the finest laboratories on the planet. And there are energy systems in there that you don't know anything about. So you're going out to start practicing medicine or be a nurse or, or a practitioner or whatever, you need to know this stuff. And that'll be an opening for you. It'll get you started in the right direction. Um, and uh, very interesting man. The, the, uh, the introduction to this is written by Candace Pert. Um, Candace Pert wrote a book called The Molecules of Emotion. Uh, she was duped out of a Nobel by good old boy school in politics. It's a very interesting read. And she opened up a whole thing with the opiate receptors and so forth. It's a fun read. But she wrote the introduction uh, to this book as well. And it's all scientifically referenced in the back. Yes? Yes, ma'am. Because there's so much energy flow along the spine, will scoliosis interfere with that energy and does that affect the results of your acupuncture? Puncture. Uh, no, actually, I've fixed a lot of scoliosis in my day. Uh, some pretty severe curves. Um, and I had one lady who uh, uh, had rods in her back, and we got it all fixed. And her, she went off to Mayo Clinic, 
and uh, had the rods removed. And, she, and also, she was one of the fastest recoveries they've ever seen at Mayo Clinic. Uh, if you're having electric, elective surgeries, in other words, you didn't get run over by a bus and you need an emergency uh, doc to sew your leg back on, um, it's nice if, you, if we do preparative work pre and post. We do work to get you ready for the surgery so you don't have complications, and then we speed up the healing process following that. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, one of the ladies who teaches she, uh, a lot of the work on that type of electrical stim I was telling you about, uh, her son, she's in Portland, and her son's in Texas going to college, and he broke a femur, compound fracture, blah, 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 blah. She gets the call. She jumps on the silver bird, flies off to see him. <clears throat> He's in the recovery room when she gets there. And uh, uh, so, she treats him in the recovery room. Okay, so the orthopod has come in, done the surgery, reset the bone, and they're not going to cast this for three days until the swelling goes down. So they've got him immobilized, and she treats him with FSM. The key thing here is that it's within the first six hours of that surgery. So the son says to him, to her, uh, Mom, when you talk to the orthopod, don't talk all that energy medicine, airy-fairy stuff. Don't talk about that. I I'd be totally embarrassed. So she doesn't. She just has a conversation with him and flies home to the practice. Three days later, the, su the surgeon is opening up all the bandages here and is telling the son, okay, it's going to be black and blue. It's going to be, it's going to look terrible, but that's normal. Just expect that. He opens that up and... Um, there is no swelling, no black and blue, no redness around the stitches, nothing going on. Okay? He doesn't even ask the question why. It's the first time he's ever seen that in his whole career. Doesn't, again, the lights don't light up here. Okay? The boy gets the cast on, flies home. Three, uh, three weeks into this, he's dying. He says, Mom, I've got to have this cast off. And she says, well, you know, we can't do that. You know, you broke your leg. It's going to be on there for a long time. So finally, he goes out to the garage. He says, I'm getting a hacksaw. I'm cutting this damn thing off. Okay? So she says, okay, I'll take you over to the orthopod. And they're in Portland now. She takes him over to the orthopod there, a friend of hers. They go in, and he x-rays. Now, for whatever reason, he took x-rays of both legs. I don't know why. She doesn't know why. But he took x-rays of both legs. He comes into the thing, pops them up on the viewfinder, and he says, which leg is broke? It's healed. That's why the plastic surgeons are using this on the, on, out in Hollywood. You don't have it here yet. But it should be in every recovery room in the, uh, in the United States because it speeds up that recovery. It's cost effective. It's safe. But you've got a six-hour window to do that with. In reference to the scoliosis too, uh, Ayurveda also has practices that are able to straighten out the spine and able to uh, bring in herbs and, and uh, other sort of manipulations that allow the muscles to reorient themselves. And a lot of it's muscle, muscle tone and muscle quality, which comes from the inside. And then that readjusts and re-manipulates the, the spine into the place that it's supposed to. So there are other options too, not just the traditional Chinese medicine, but the Ayurveda as well. Jim? My question is directed to both presenters with respect to the Kansas City physician example. Mm -hmm. I am interested to learn from both of you as to how can you explain a culture that would be resistant to learning more? If the cancer was gone, then why would the Kansas City physician's former colleagues at the Kansas City Emergency Medical Center would not want to learn more? What is going on there? I think, from my perspective, they've had so much mine. education that they know what they know. I'll give you an example. The immunologist that I used to work with and do the research with, Glenn Rohde, was trained by Robert A. Good. Who the heck is he? He went on to head Memorial Sloan Kettering, one of the cancer treatment centers in New York. He's a big wig and a mover and shaker and a very brilliant man. At the time, he was head of the immunology in, up in Minnesota. And that's where Glenn was doing his interning in immunology. And they have something called Grand Rounds. All the hospitals have this for. And so they have a present, uh, the, the presenters were a couple of young interns. And they're presenting a case uh, in this Grand Rounds. And uh, 
there is, uh, they're saying we had a white female, blah, 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 presented with such and such, we gave her the standard of care. She was not responding. We noticed this, this, and this, so we began to do this, that, and the other thing. Non-standard care. And they went into this whole thing, talked about how she responded and improved. And an elderly physician in the back of that auditorium stood up and, said, and read him the riot act and said, you cannot deliver care that's non-standard. Don't you ever do that again? I've got 30 years of experience. At which point Robert A. Good stood up and said, <clears throat> you have one year of experience and you've made the same mistake for 29 years. You get the point? And that's what you find. I've, I've, but I, I used to think everybody was a Marcus Welby. I used to think everybody was Donna Reed's doc until I got into the world and saw what's going on. And these people don't talk to each other. They're non-communicators. They're very well educated. They know what they know, but they don't know what they don't know. And they've stopped questioning. And that's why this is what's going on here. Also, there's economic and political reasons. But, you know, there's a lot of factors that's uh, involved with that, from my perspective. Mike? Yeah, my point of view on that, uh, Dr. Gray, is that uh, people are trained and learned to think a certain way. And we develop mental patterns and habits. And those mental patterns and habits, according to the yoga tradition, are strong and don't necessarily allow themselves to be altered. And we even begin to look upon reality from the perspective that we've developed inside of our thinking patterns. They're called, in the yoga tradition, call their samskaras or patterns or thinkings, so thinking in that way. Um, and those, those patterns then are not ever changed unless there's another pattern that begins to come into the person's life. And that other pattern really can only come in through, um, as far as I understand, through meditative practices, where the person begins to more and more set themselves into a quiet state and then in that quiet state, they then re let go of thoughts, let go of ideas, let go of, of things, and begin to just focus on a, a one point, either a light or a word or, or the breath or something along those lines. In that process, what happens then, and there's a, a research being done right here in Madison, Wisconsin, on that whole thing. In that process then, what happens is there are new neural systems that begin to develop within the prefrontal cortex up here prefrontal lobes, allowing for more options and more opportunities, more uh, ways of doing things that might be available that I might not have thought of before. So the part of the reason that we are set in the mindset is because we are not doing, from my perspective, practices that will allow us to open our mind to, to new ways of life. I don't um, blame the people who are set in their ways. I just, and I'm not angry and upset with them, I'm just sad that there are not those options and possibilities there. And, and it's important. They see themselves as having to do this because that's the mindset that they have. And they have not necessarily developed other patterns to help them keep expanding and growing that, that neural system. So I, I don't see it as a matter of a person being good or bad or, or doing right and wrong, but they just, they just don't have those practices. Let me, let me just uh, jump in one second here. Um, Richard Helms um, is a, a medical doc, but he's also an oriental medical doc as well. And he uses quantum mechanics to bridge the gap for the thought processes from linear deductive logic, which Western medicine is entrenched in, into the holistic perspective of treating the whole person. Uh, when we treat, uh, you know, you might have problems with the liver or the kidneys or whatever, but there's relationships of these organ networks and systems that have to be respected because you, it's part of the whole process. The whole is much greater than the sum of the parts, and that's missing in the concepts here. Um, um, and quantum physics would help understand that because the, the whole idea of quantum physics is the interconnectedness of reality and also the wholeness of reality. It's a very, that's a very significant thing. And, and for scientists, that's probably the inroad that we need to move in because that's where scientists will then say, okay, 
Now, now we have something solid here, but actually they're moving into, as John is saying, into a world of options and world of possibilities. I was going to just mention one other thing um, with autism, for example, and the reason I'm mentioning that, because some of you may be with, uh, with the organization here in Fond du Lac that has to do with autism. Um, and just to give you a quick example, um, uh, there's a doc on the West Coast who um, was treating uh, autism. Uh, a mother brought in her son, very autistic. On the scale, he's way into the autism with the violence and, and the irrational behavior and all those types of things. He treated this child for about uh, six or eight months. Unbeknownst to him, the mother then, because he was behaving much better, went to the school system, because he hadn't been in school, and said, you know, he's been out of school for a while, like to help him catch up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Did not mention autism to the uh, principal and the guidance counselors and all the other people. Put him in school. This was in September. Goes in for a conference uh, late November, early December. The report was, model student. He's all caught up, doing a great job. He gets along with everybody. He's doing a wonderful job. And she says to them, do you know that he's autistic? And they looked at her and said, you're nuts. Your child is not autistic. And I'll give you an example with that. <clears throat> real quick, because uh, with oils, therapeutic, I use therapeutic grade essential oils. If you take the brain scan of an autistic child, you're going to see some abnormalities there. If you put them on Ritalin, the abnormality is still there. If you use certain therapeutic grade essential oils, guess what? Brain pattern improves, goes to normal. If you interview the teachers and the students who are in the class with little Johnny or little Susie who's autistic, they, they like him the least when he's on the Ritalin, slightly better when he's off the Ritalin, and best when he's on the oils. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, okay next, last question then. Push it real hard and it'll go on. And keep it, hold it there and it'll, it'll go. You have to Right. No, it's not. Uh, they're not allowed to practice medicine. No, all of the, unless you have a, t a diploma in acupuncture, I'm not allowed to practice medicine um, out of my practice. There are very, very definite, very, very precise legal patterns and legal rules that have to be followed. And, and if they're not followed, then the person is, uh, quote, practicing medicine without a license, and that's against the law. Yes, there are. Within the practices themselves, there are very specific guidelines, and you have to stay within those guidelines. Yoga therapy, aromatherapy, the certificate, but you can't say you're practicing medicine. If you say you're practicing medicine, the term that's used to sort of sidestep the legal issue is uh, you're an educator. You're educating a person on how to handle themselves or take care of themselves. Please take some time to fill out the evaluation. I've been asked to let you know that. If there are any questions that you have at all, this, this is just the beginning of the box that is opening up in our world here. And I thank you very much for your attention. I thank you very much for your, for your interest. And God bless you all.